Welcome to the Meta Woman Podcast. We address the issues, opportunities, and challenges facing women in the development of the metaverse, the biggest revolution since the internet itself. Every week, we bring you conversations with top female talent and business executives operating in the gaming and crypto industries. Here's your host, Lindsay the Boss Poss. The Meta Woman Podcast starts now. Hello, and welcome to the Meta Woman Podcast, part of the Holodeck Media Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lindsay the Boss Poss, and from struggle to success, we're covering it all. Our returning listeners, thank you so much for supporting the show. Our new listeners, welcome. I hope you enjoy. You'll get very used to hearing this intro, I'm sure. Today's guest is super special because she is at the pinnacle of gaming, mental health, and emerging tech. So just really crazy overlap between those three categories. I'm excited to welcome Sarah Hill, CEO and Chief Storyteller and founder of Helium. Taken directly from its website, Helium is, quote, a mental fitness tool that offers you a new active approach to meditation that is powered by your body's electricity. Utilize real-time data to train your brain so you can self-manage your anxiety, focus more intently, and sleep better, end quote. I also want to note that it's Helium as in H-E-A-L-I-U-M, so Heal. Uh, Sarah, welcome to the show. Please introduce yourself a little further than I just did and give the audience a bit of your backstory and what you do. Lindsay, it's so great to be here with you and, and your listeners. And I am a former television reporter and covered a lot of trauma. So developed helium for me, as well as the millions of people who struggle with anxiety and want to sleep better and feel better in a drugless way. Oh, I love that. I actually want to start with kind of your your hero origin story here. Um, you developed this company and moved into the tech space and we will get into that, but I want to start actually back in your very successful career as a broadcast TV journalist. I understand you're a 12 time mid America Emmy award winner, which is a lot, <laughs> like more than two hands worth. That's how you know that you were very good. Um, many moons ago, we talked about the kind of pressure that that spotlight has and more fundamentally, I'm sure plenty of people can relate to having a stressful job or having a stressful life or dealing with trauma, receiving feedback or going through difficult experiences and that kind of general anxiety that and as of right now, especially in a post pandemic world just comes from being alive. Um, but can you speak to how your career in broadcast journalism, you mentioned it very lightly already, helped motivate you to create helium and and move into the kind of healing space? Absolutely. So I spent 20 years as a, a broadcast journalism. I worked for the ABC, NBC, CBS news affiliates in Missouri. And as you know, part of that job, you hear this with a lot of journalists, a lot of journalists experience burnout. Uh, they have panic attacks. They have difficulty sleeping because they're constantly feeding the beast and constantly, um, you know, uh, covering trauma, interviewing people who've lost children. Um, we went out with the trauma teams in the aftermath of the tsunami in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. And so you as a journalist have to cover sometimes the worst day uh, of people's lives. And in order to be a good storyteller, you need to step inside their story and experience what they're experiencing to be able to properly communicate it um, in, in a video story. So, you know, as a, a journalist, we absorbed a lot of that pain and you never think that it's, you know, you cover a homicide in the morning, you, you know, might go to a, a trial in the afternoon, you, you know, and interview uh, someone, you have to knock on, you know, doors of families that have experienced great loss in their life. Um, because sadly, you know, that's, that's your job. And ultimately, that and uh, you know, I worked in great environments with great uh, bosses who you know, continue to be my mentors and great uh, stations and opportunities. And it wasn't that I wasn't supported. It's just the nature of the business. And ultimately that stress and uh, made me sick with insomnia and the inability to sleep. And you don't really realize how insomnia can impact your body and not having that mental reset every night until it backfires. And it backfired on me in the form of 
um, uh, panic attacks. And once you have a panic attack, if you've ever had one, it's like someone turned up the volume full steam, set your hair on fire and um, an elephant on your chest. That yeah, was nice. <laughs> difficulty breathing. And all of a sudden mm-hmm. your body is short circuited and you feel like what is going on? You feel like a lion, mm-hmm. you know, is going to attack you, but yet there's no lion in the room. And that's just, you know, your body revolting in that fight or flight um, area. And my husband was a, he, he's still my husband, but he used to be a counseling psychologist. And, you know, he, he said to me, Sarah, I know exactly what's happening because I thought is a stroke. Am I having a heart attack? <laughs> you know, it's all these things. And I, I didn't want to admit to myself that no, you know, it was everything that I had, had absorbed over the last cu- couple decades and um, was looking for drugless solutions and found neurofeedback. And in the old days of neurofeedback, and this was, you know, 15 years ago when I was experiencing insomnia and you had to glue electrodes, glue, like literally with glue electrodes on your scalp and your forehead um, and do these games. And at the time they were kind of boring where it was training your brain to, you know, uh, calm itself so that you could learn to sleep and learn to self-regulate your brain patterns. And, you know, here I was at the time I was in my forties, I had never learned how to self-regulate my brain patterns on my heart rate. And it's, you know, a a sad state of all the things that you learn in your life, yet you don't learn how your own mind operates or, or how you can actually control it. And nobody had said to me, you know, did you know that you can actually control your brain patterns and your heart rate? And had I known, you know, that I, I might've learned it. But um, in those neurofeedback sessions, I found them kind of boring in a way. So I would make up stories um, because I was a a storyteller in order to make it more engaging for me. And to make a long story short, we developed Helium um, and added that neurofeedback integration uh, in virtual and augmented reality. We were doing uh, virtual tours for a group of veterans who weren't able to physically travel to see their memorials in Washington, DC. And I would create video stories in virtual reality of their memorials so they could see them. And um, to make a long story short, in all of those tours, we noticed that VR appeared to be affecting the veterans physiology. They weren't just watching these experiences. It was, it was if somehow they were feeling them. So I reached out to uh, that neurofeedback specialist who was actually my husband's business partner in his practice at the time and said, can you do some brain maps, uh, you know, on these individuals experiencing these stories uh, because something's happening inside their, their mind. Um, and I just, you know, would like to gain more clarity on what's you know going on because they take off the headset, their body appears relaxed. They take, <sighs> a deep cleansing breath. And they say, I like how I, how I felt. Can I watch that again? And so we, you know, uh, Dr. Tarrant did a brain map, could see significant shifts in the fast activity in their brain very quickly in a matter of minutes. And, you know, I remember him saying to me, this is significant. This kind of media, you know, could have healing uh, uh, abilities to allow people to learn to self-regulate. And what if we, you know, imported the brain patterns in there that they could actually do those neurofeedback sessions inside virtual reality um, or in augmented reality without the goggles? And that led us on a very long path of doing additional research. Uh, We have five peer reviewed journals uh, trying to develop what kind of media impacts brain patterns and heart rate in in certain way. So helium of, of sorts is like a media detox for all of the negative fiber that you put in your media diet throughout the day. Wow, I'm sure that you have talked about this at length by now and given that that sort of backstory to many folks, but I I have to commend you for also sharing your own mental health struggles, which is something that can be very difficult and for collecting these different experiences and putting them together um, because it's, it's quite a lot of different pieces to kind of connect um, between, you know, your own work and what you went through to the work you did with veterans to the work you had seen in, in your husband's practice or in that community and then putting it all together into one cohesive kind of plan is 
is really cool. Um, along oh, thank you. It wasn't just me. It was, we had a great, we have a great team. I'm sure. Yeah. It's, someone has to be the visionary though, too. And it's cool. It's neat to hear how you were able to think of those things and, and bring in people who could support these ideas and, and help create and develop those ideas further as well. Very cool to, to find the junction of all of those. It's <laughs> so like I said, it's not every day you meet someone who is in gaming and VR and creating mental health solutions. Yeah, um, it, it was a drunken sailor walk, if you will, the entrepreneurial <laughs> journey, as they call it. It was not linear, a linear path in any way. It was, you know, skills that I had, a need that I saw. What kind of skills do I have to fit that need? Who's in my network? And how can we learn, you know, how to make these experiences in a way that can even far more greatly, um, you know, uh, allow people to self-manage their anxiety and sleep. Yeah, well, and I want to, I know I'm jumping around a bit here, but I do want to talk about the sleep portion because since we've last spoken, um, Sleepium, I have seen come to fruition. Yeah. So can you explain that part of the app and what it does? Yeah, so Sleepium is a new product. It's within Helium. So if you're a Helium subscriber, you get Sleepium as well. And these are experiences that are designed to downshift the nervous system. So they're meant to be viewed in a reclined position, either in your bed. And, and these goggles, uh, by the way, come with blue light filters. So there's a night mode that you can uh, put on. And they're all calming experiences. The dreams that you have um, after, you know, watching some of these sleepy experiences, mine are um, fascinating. And I actually remember them, which usually I don't, don't remember them as well. And so that's um, uh, been out for about a couple months. And, you know, you can put the headset on your bedside, uh, take a sleepium before you go to bed at night. And then during the day, you can train with helium, uh, train with an EEG headband so that you can actually see your own brain patterns displayed inside the, the screen because the self-management of anxiety and that, that self-care during the day Sleep hygiene isn't just before you go to bed at night. It's during the day um, and in learning how to, you know, self-regulate your brain patterns and, and heart rate. Not a replacement, any of this for psychotropic medication or professional counseling, which we all know is one of the best things that we can do for yourself ourselves. But as a self-coping me mechanism, a drugless, non-harmful coping mechanism. Um, it is valuable to be able to learn to self-regulate during the day and train during the day and then lay down at, at night and, um, you know, float through a butterfly island, um, you know, glide through a, a, a glacial lake. Um, all of these are beautiful nature-based escapes that have the option during the day to be powered by your brain patterns. So cool. And I actually want to jump back in because I realized we didn't go fully into what helium is either. So we actually started with sleepium. And I would love for you to talk about that more because we've talked a lot about the VR portion, but I know that there's also an AR portion. So it's really accessible to a lot of different folks. Um, so can you tell me more about the kind of the services that or tell the audience more about the services that helium offers, how it works, um, what kind of feedback you've gotten? And I mean, I will say I've used it and it's Beautiful. So highly okay. recommend. <laughs> Thank you. So VR goggles are not required in augmented reality just on your mobile device. You can open up a magic portal in your living room or in your bedroom, and you can walk through that portal. Or if you don't have mobility, you can teleport through that portal. And then you're in, inside another beautiful magical kingdom, a nebula in space, a peaceful waterfall. Um, you can float through the center of your brain and learn about how all of the synapses fire and how your thoughts have power, actually. What you think about has a direct impact on your brain patterns and, and your heart rate. And, um, you know, uh, in augmented reality, that's how it works in its very simplest form. It's a free app that you can download on iOS and Android. Uh, just search the Helium store, the, the app store for Helium, H-E-A-L-I-U-M. And then in virtual reality on either uh, Oculus Quest, Pico G2 4K, Pico Neo 3, Vive, uh, Vive Focus, Vive Flow. Search the app store for Helium. 
and then um, that we have a free version. In that free version, you don't have the ability to connect a wearable, but that's okay. Some people just you know like to use it without a wearable, and there's limited content, but it will give you a, a, a taste of what some of these experiences are like. And then if you subscribe, you have the ability to get a helium score, which is a score associated with your focus calm, uh, according to your, your brain patterns. And then also uh, you can see a session length. So how long that you've been using it and you can download your own data um, to track your, your progress over time. And so uh, either in VR or in, in AR without the goggles, you have the ability to use it. However, VR is more engaging, more memorable, and it more greatly tricks the brain into thinking that it's someplace else because it's more immersive. In augmented rea reality, it's a little bit more variable because you're seeing your own real world. And that real world inside your living room might be all the clutter that you have on the couch that's reminding you that you have to clean it up. Um, but you're able to bring in those assets inside your own environment, even without um, goggles. And remember some of those experiences that perhaps if you do have VR goggles, you've created an associative memory that you can then go back to in a stressful situation or go back to outside of the goggles just on, on your mobile device in order to, to learn to, to, to downshift. And this is just media, healing, healing media that is allowing people to learn how their brain patterns work, how their heart rate works, and um, you know, learn to self-regulate. I actually want to talk a little bit about, I mean, so I understand why you developed each for AR and VR because they each have their strengths. The AR is super accessible on the go, wherever you are. The VR is the more immersive, um, more like learning based or um, I guess healing based is kind of a good way to say it experience um, that is is probably more for like kind of a longer term uh, person who's trying to to keep uh, or to learn better how to self-regulate. But can you tell me what it was like to develop across platforms too? I mean, developing for an AR on your phone and what those environments are going to look like is presumably very different developing VR experiences. And then also just what it's like developing for several different VR goggles. This isn't something we get into a lot, but in the traditional gaming industry, a lot of companies will develop for Xbox or for PC or some will develop across platform. But what is that kind of cross platform like in the AR VR space? Yeah, it's difficult. So, um, you know, specifically in the early days where there wasn't a lot of tools that you could create at once and then click a button and it automatically deploys to all of the others, you know, like we have in some of those ways with iOS and, and Android, but um, more of those tools are, are coming online. And so, you know, as a company, we had to develop almost individual apps for each um, headset because the headsets are different. Their inputs are different. Their remote controls are different. How they collect uh, or how they connect to Bluetooth um, are, are different as well. And so it was, was difficult. And not to mention the fact that we are, you know, importing a user's brainwaves into the experience. And how do you tell stories with biometric data? Um, and not only that, but it's stories in, in the round. And uh, quite honestly, you, you know, when it comes to, uh, we created the virtual reality app first, and then we created the augmented reality app as a companion to the, the, the virtual reality um, experience. So on that AR app, you have the ability to cast it to your mobile device. And, you know, you can start on your mobile device, you know, select a VR thumbnail that you want to send to your headset um, and then it sends it to your headset and you can automatically uh, put it on. But as a long story short, um, yes, it was difficult because while those two mediums, virtual reality being completely immersive inside the goggles and augmented reality being a 3D asset imported into your real world environment are very different. They're also very the same in that the line between AR and VR is blurring into you know, what we call XR. And in our shop, X just means solve for X. It's extended reality, whether that be AR, VR, or MR. 
and uh, you know, much as in the early days of still images and video, there is a very distinctive line between still images and video. And now still images get inserted into video all the time and it's still just video, right? It's, it's the same um, with AR and, and VR. And we're seeing that the headset manufacturers as well, you know, with their pass through cameras and their augmented reality uh, development tools blur that line as well in that, um, you know, uh, these VR experiences more and more, you know, you can tap the side of your headset and then you see the real world. And it's gonna be the same uh, thing in the future more and more with VR apps, that there's also gonna be an augmented reality option if you wanna see the real world and just see those assets super superimposed over it. Um, not all experiences are there yet and for us, uh, they're separate entities, but we know in the metaverse, um, you know, it's not just going to be in a virtual reality he headset. It's going to be in some kind of heads up display. Um, and, uh, you know, collectively, you can embody uh, avatars in augmented reality experiences as well. So we see that line blur blurring. And we also saw the need to be ambidextrous on both platforms so that we can be ready when the metaverse is fully built uh, to hop in into uh, whatever medium it is to allow people to experience helium and, and sleepium. So cool. I'm actually glad that you went over through the term XR because that's a term that I've seen pop up now multiple times um, and haven't had a great basis for understanding, but I like this idea of them of AR and VR experiences bleeding into one another and taking, taking cues from each of them to create kind of a new version of reality for people to experience. I want to pick apart since you brought up the metaverse, of course, we, we talk a lot about the metaverse on this podcast and it's a lot of fun, but what are you, first of all, what does that word mean to you? And what you as a person who's developing these experiences, particularly working in the field of mental health, are you excited? Are you nervous? Or what do you think about how the metaverse is going to help or hurt us with mental health? What is this impact going to be like as emerging tech becomes more familiar in our day-to-day -day routines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the answer to that is yes and no. Will it help us or you know hurt our, our mental health? Much like any kind of technology, it, it depends on how you wield that. and. To me, the metaverse is very simply the immersive internet where you can live, work, and play. And these are, you know, immersive uh, landscape, landscapes that you can go into and collectively experience a group uh, helium experience that's powered collectively by your biometric data or your, your brain patterns. And those are collectively pooled among the group. And you know, together they're they're controlling assets in in the environment. But those platforms are very are nascent right now. Um, you know, there's there are companies doing great work in that space. But the ecosystem for developers is is just starting, and also the user base is just starting as well. And so um, uh, I'm excited about the future of the metaverse. To, to collectively bring together people in a singular space to have, exper to have experiences and also conversations about mental health, mental wellness, and mental fitness. And, um, you know, there is power in, in group activities. And so that's why we're, you know, uh, looking forward to the, the onset of the, of the metaverse. With that being said, how do you kind of balance that with? people who have, or with general media, public, whatever, who has criticisms about this tech coming, about the way we currently interact with tech, like, what do you say to folks who are on the very much, you know, more tech is bad kind of spectrum for things, um, and mm -hmm. obviously is, is particularly bad for mental health? Um, mm -hmm. How are you thinking about how to reach out and approach those people and get them to see the vision that you have, which I think is very positive and a very different take on on the way we can treat mental health? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, 
you know, uh, not all technology is bad. It's, it's a diet and we call this a media diet. So there's a great film out there um, from, from 2020. I'm sure many of your listeners saw it called The Social Dilemma. And it talks about, um, you know, the risks and the um, fallout of the rise of social media. 25% of youth and young adults, we call them the yaya generation, have suicidal ideation. And so uh, that came about with, uh, uh, you know, you could argue, was it a coincidence or not? Um, but that, you know, mental health emergency came about at about the same time with the rise of social media. And obviously, youth and young adults, they're comparing themselves to others are spending a lot of time in social media and it's become addictive. And, you know, what uh, we are advocating for in Helium is it's a diet. Um, you know, do you need social social media? Well, you can make an argument. Yes or no. Uh, social media has uh, you know, value in that it can help keep you safe. Is there a tornado in my neighborhood? Um, is there a child molester living next door to me? It allows you to stay connected to people. Um, and loneliness is also a health threat. Um, it also allows you to, to know who to vote for, who to vote against. It's, it's information. And so there are good, good aspects to that rise of social media. But left unchecked, if you are not properly maintaining your media diet, it'll make you sick. And if you're constantly consuming negative media and research shows what you watch has a direct impact on your brain patterns and heart rate. So what you're consuming in that media, it, you know, it can also trigger trauma inside mm -hmm. you as well. So you have to temper that with reality. And that's, you know, the best way is, is reality, but not everybody lives near a park or a beautiful forest or has the funds to take a trip to, you know, whatever, whatever, um, uh, you know, beautiful waterfall in, in South America. So enter, you know, healing media, uh, media that is positive fiber to your media diet and also, you know, specifically designed in a way to try to uh, you know, uh, shift your, your brain patterns, allow you to become more self-aware uh, of how to self-regulate and also try to create some unique uh, memories that you can go back to in a stressful situation. So if you can't see the mountains in reality, in virtual reality, you can have a unique memory that you can go back to. And research shows that um, when you view these experiences inside a, a, a headset, that it is more of a, more engaging and more memorable than if you saw it through the filter of watching a, a video on, on your phone. So that's a very long explanation, but it is a diet, a media diet that, um, you know, we as consumers uh, have the ability to control. That's, you have used many terms throughout this that I think are great. Mental fitness is one downshifting is one sleep hygiene is one um but i do really like the idea of uh positive fiber in a media diet as well well in media diet is another one um these are good words to frame a lot of the issues um which is just that's a side note but that's i i appreciate adding this terminology to my vernacular to my patterns as well um and i it's fascinating to me that you're working to actually create virtual memories that is that's so cool <laughs> i mean i don't know how to yeah i think even the most Lede, like the highest form of luddites would be excited to hear that like that's just really cool <laughs> it's it's uh you know uh, selfishly i haven't always been able to get to beautiful landscapes so um you know helpful for me to be able to have that place that, that you can go back to in your mind whenever you need it, regardless of whether or not you have a mobile device or whether or not you have virtual reality goggles. Um, you know, we all need that, that place to remember. So cool. I want to pivot a little bit into actually building a company um, because that's something that you have experience with as well. Uh, and this helium has been around since 2016, if I'm not mistaken. So just over the five year mark here. And I, I know that you, 
have done a great many things with it. But one thing that I saw recently was a story about the NFL pitch competition. Um, and the pitch competition specifically is aimed at helping pro players reduce stress and anxiety through non-drug based treatments. You know, the NFL PA is really involved in that. Um, I've seen a lot more athletes open up about their struggles with mental health. I think in the way that you bring attention to a lot of broadcast and, and media journalism or journalism roles, the NFLPA has brought a lot of attention to um, professional sports and what that can be like. But tell me about what it has been like for you um, winning the NFL pitch competition, building the company as a woman, um, and what kind of skills you're able to take from your background in media and entertainment to help you on this journey and, and to have the successes you've had. So it was a great experience and the NFL and the NFLPA are doing very important work on mental health and wellness. Matter of fact, they recently formed a, a mental health and, and wellness committee to focus specifically on, you know, what are some tools uh, that they can get in, in players hands um, and, and their families and, you know, elite athletes, the immense stress that they encounter not only from a performance anxiety perspective, but, you know, what they get in their social media feeds and, you know, at, at media conferences and the, the, the pressure that they have um, is immense. And yet as an elite athlete, you know, um, not all uh, either want to, to seek counseling, although it's, you know, one of the best things uh, that, that's out there or have the ability to you know take a psychotropic medication because with anti-doping you know it, it can in, impact their their human performance as well and so you know helium sleepium drugless solutions a lot of players travel and you know downshifting in their their mind at night in order to sleep is is difficult and so this is a you know a drugless way that you know you can uh, have a cleanse at night if you will and, you know, put a, a beautiful memory in your mind before before you go to bed at night. So the pitch competition was held a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas during the NFL draft. And we were delighted to be among six really amazing companies doing important work with human performance and entertainment um, and a, a variety of different ways that, that they're adding value to and hydration uh, that they're adding value to elite, elite athletes. So it also, you know, unlocks some some phenomenal opportunities for us that we're just beginning to realize. And so grateful for that that opportunity and excited to get helium in the hands of more elite athletes um, and also amateur athletes as well. Uh, we recently formed a partnership with Athletes Unlimited, which works with uh, professional uh, female sports teams. And we're excited wow. that they're using helium as well, because just as you work out your body, so too, do you work out your mind and mental fitness is very important as well. You reduce anxiety, you increase working memory, which reduces the likelihood of errors. Um, it increases, uh, you know, the likelihood of better management decisions. And so, you know, the value of having that drugless, non-harmful coping mechanism that you can use uh, at night or to train with during during the day is really valuable for those elite athletes. And we're seeing that borne out with Naomi Osaka, um, uh, you know, all of the different di different players who, uh, you know, talk about getting the twisties uh, before the, the, the Olympics. And, you know, we need to be having conversations, not just about the, the pharmaceutical interventions, but the, the great many non-pharmaceutical, uh, non-harmful coping mechanisms that people can use when they need it as a part of a digital drug that's in your medicine cabinet. So cool. Um, and I know we, I, I wrapped up about four questions within that question, but can you tell me about building the company, the journey you've taken as an entrepreneur and what that's been like for you as a woman? Mm -hmm. Or just in yes. general. I mean, it doesn't have to be through the lens of gender, but just curious yeah. about your experiences. Yeah. So building a company is um, awesome. And it's with a lot of challenges, though. We are located in the middle of the Silicon Prairie, as we call it, in the Midwest. 
which historically lacks access to venture capital. And so a lot of people have never heard of us before. Um, and they are you know, surprised to hear about a tech company operating in, in the Midwest. We always joke, we say, yes, we just got the internet last year and <laughs> you know, running water and oh, no. <laughs> really you know, in the age of the internet and specifically post pandemic, you know, companies can happen, you know, uh, great companies happen everywhere, uh, not just on, on the coast. So it was a challenge for us um, in raising capital. And uh, not only we know, you know, the story about female founders and their struggles with, with raising capital, um, but also, you know, being located where we were. But, um, you know, we raised millions of dollars in the middle of a pandemic because our product was providing value for people. And in, in, in a drugless way, and people took notice. And so, you know, um, Columbia has a great many future uni unicorns um, with the likes of Zapier and Equipment Share, uh, Veterans United, Beyond Meat also has, has roots in, in Columbia, Missouri. And um, we're at a strategic advantage compared to the coast because our cost of goods is significantly lower. And so those investment dollars go further. And also, you know, it, based in the Midwest, we build our companies on revenue, not just investment dollars, which uh, makes us more capital uh, efficient going forward. So what some at first, you know, uh, might seem to the outsider as a strategic disadvantage, it was actually an advantage uh, because uh, we were able to do more with less. Do you have any that I do think that that's a very intelligent way to build companies and especially in a world where we've seen many a company say profit doesn't matter and, and really go for it. And there's a place for that, too. I'm not denying that. Um, but I, for people who are thinking of perhaps not Uber sized ventures um, and even I know that you you run a a good mid-sized outfit where you are, but do you have any advice for people who are looking to start and particularly in the area you're in, in the Midwest, who are looking to start their own? Is there anything you would redo if you could go back, you know, to the mm -hmm. six years ago since you've been in business? Yeah. So you mean start their own companies, people yes. who are getting ready? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're a first time entrepreneur, Keep in mind that your family, your friends, or your support network, they are your first co-founders. So before you even, you know, set foot on stepping out and forming a company, you need to make sure your co-founders, your, your family and friends are okay with you being away uh, and, you know, distracted with this huge commitment because it is a huge commitment. Um, you can't just, you know, stick your toe in, in the water um, you know, you, you have to cannonball in, um, in order to immerse yourself to, to build a successful company. So keep in mind that your, your family is your first uh, co-founder. In those early days, you will have a, a large amount of people trying to take a lot of equity uh, from you, whether it be in accelerator programs that take significant amount of, of equity. Uh, get some consult with that and um, uh, surround yourself with advisors who maybe in the early days, they don't take any equity. They're just, you know, giving you their input. There are plenty of people out there um, who are willing to help, you know, a, another uh, entrepreneur and give honest opinions without taking any equity in, in, in the company. Um, because ultimately that's what you're building. Uh, when you take on co-founders or um, other, you know, founders in, in the company before you award equity, you need to make sure that they are um, uh, going to be there when it's raining buckets in the middle of the night. Uh, and you know, uh, you find as you go along in the journey that uh, some people that you encounter are their founders. They are there uh, all, you know, all, all the time and um, uh, they have that founder's mi mindset. And then you have others who are employees um, and, you know, great, great employees in the company, but perhaps, you know, they value um, uh, not getting up at, at two in the morning or, you know, going that extra mile or, you know, working on weekends, 
you know, there are p- the people who value uh, that w- and which is great. You need both kinds of people in, in the company. You need founders and then you have employees. Um, and so uh, make sure when you bring people on that, you know, before you uh, award them that uh, founder status or that equity, that you make sure that you explain that there is a difference between an equity holder in the company and also, you know, a regular employee, um, you know, uh, and, and and that greater greater responsibility, um, because early on, a lot of companies that's that's a common mistake that they they get. I also had someone who told me once that before you want to hire anyone, take a shower and ask yourself, do you really need this person? And early on, that was great for us um, huh. because okay, approach, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you get older, as your company advances and you need to scale faster, that mindset does not work right. anymore. But in the early days, you think, oh, well, I have this project. I need to hire someone for that project. No, chances are you need a contractor that can do that one time project mm-hmm. and then, then they're, they're done. Um, and so, um, you know, granted, I was doing, a, a, a you know, a, a one woman show for a significant amount of time, but it also allowed, you know, you to retain a lot of equity in company. And then the the last piece of advice that I would give you is that anyone who is going to work on your apps or your development uh, needs to have ironclad work product ownership agreements. And so uh, whether it be through your IP attorney or, uh, you know, whatever legal you have, no one touches, you don't get into any conversation until you've either signed a non-disclosure agreement or uh, with, with that potential contractor or mm-hmm. that, that, you know, you, you've hammered out that work product uh, ownership agreement so that it's clear that the, the company owns that IP. And then, okay, sorry, the fourth one is that even okay. if you don't think you have intellectual property, get an IP consult. And if you have one firm that tells you, well, there's nothing patentable here, it's just software, go to another mm-hmm. one. Um, because we en- encountered that um, er- early on, and we now have, you know, very significant, broad, valuable patents in in that space, connecting consumer wearables to the to the metaverse. But even if you think, I, oh, there's nothing to be protected here, it's just software or, or whatever. No, it's not just software. There is a system and a method that can be protected. Um, and which is, you know, very valuable in a future exit for a company or a company trying to raise venture capital. Those were all really great pieces of advice. The one last thing I want to ask you about when it comes to building a company and where you are in middle America is were there any events or things? Obviously, the pitch competition is huge for the NFL, but were there any ones very early on where it was like, this is where I got a good mentor this is where i learned a lot or this is what helped my business grow was there anything any um events or even i don't know part, like going to university and speaking or things of that nature where you were able to put yourself out there and really see a return on that absolutely you were we were building. involved we were involved in about a half a dozen different accelerator programs where gotcha. we just kept learning 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 uh, stadia uh, ventures they have an accelerator program for human performance and sports uh, enterprise companies. That was phenomenal. The, the mentors in, in that group really moved the needle and introduced us to some important people in the industry, um, as well as Mass Challenge. Uh, we uh, uh, won a prize at the Mass Challenge Houston program, which also introduced us to some very important advisors for us that have you know significantly moved the, the needle for helium and then in our very early days we were part of a program called mizzou venture mentoring service and all universities have an entrepreneurship most of them do mentoring service um, they also mm-hmm. have entrepreneurship legal clinics so if you, you can't afford an attorney mm-hmm. for an ip consult go to them they might have you know the ability to to line one up for you and those mentors were our first board of directors before we had a board of directors. And, mm-hmm. you know, as a company, you want to keep that board 
uh, small. So surrounding yourself with a variety of mentors who can counsel you on, you know, your pro forma, um, uh, you know, legal questions, employee equity plans, um, you know, all those kinds of, of questions that come up in, in forming a company. So they don't just have to be a, a, a board of directors. Uh, you can surround yourself with mentors in that that early day, and they were very instrumental in our growth and development. Oh, so many good resources in there. So I hope that folks out there who are listening can can take a lot of those and run with them. Before we get into the last little segment, and we're running up on time, so I'm trying to go so speedy. Um, I'm going to do a quick summary of what we talked about. We started with your past in journalism and how it was a churn and burn industry, very difficult. You had to tell the story of the worst day of many people's lives and put yourself in the shoe is of those people to do that. And so you had your own kind of journey with mental health and mental health struggles that really motivated you to then later on create Helium in conjunction with some other experiences, helping veterans and doing lots of cool stuff, which I just thought was a really cool kind of origin story for you. Helium is an accessible AR VR world and set slash set of worlds to help you learn about your own neural patterns. There's an associated Helium score to keep track of how you're interacting with the app and how well you're kind of learning yourself. The VR is the more immersive form that can where a lot of I think deep learning can take place. Um, but the AR is AR is more of kind of an accessible form, and they are uh, they do work in conjunction with each other to create portable experiences to help you no matter where you may be physically um, and when you need time to actually downshift there, there. Sleepium is also a companion product. I love the names of these things as a side note. But Sleepium is a companion product, product specifically designed to downshift the nervous system. It's made to be consumed laying down before bed, and it can be considered part of a regular sleep hygiene routine, which I thought was a great uh, term. Um, we talked about developing cross-platform and how it is difficult. You started having to develop individual apps for each headset. As time goes on, there's more tools to help, but six years is, is quite a long time in the VR space. And, and I know that at first, you, I know you went through a lot with getting that app up and running. Um, as of right now, AR and VR are blending into each other to form XR. So the experiences are companion to each other and encourage continuity between what users learned on, from one to the other. We then got into a discussion on the metaverse and how it is a place to collectively or individually experience virtual worlds, but that you are looking forward to the power that comes from group activities. And as more folks join, experiences will only get better. We shifted to talk about media diets and why they're important. There are risks to technology consumption and young people in particular are facing a mental health crisis in conjunction with the rise of social media and emerging technology. But maintaining a medium diet will help you prevent or prevent some of those uh, more difficult things that can come with technology. It's important to temper your media consumption with reality and Helium Media aims to be a positive fiber in that medium media diet to create calming memories that you can then return to in stressful situations. So one thing that I thought was really key is that you like to create memories for people who may not be able to actually explore those same physical worlds. Um, or have access to those same physical worlds, but still can implant the memory to return to either in an awake, awoken state, awakened state, awakened state, or a dream state, whatever that word may be. Um, the last thing we kind of ended on was a discussion on entrepreneurship and how you were able to build your business in the middle of the Silicon Prairie in Missouri. We talked about how raising capital can be challenging, especially at first and particularly for female founders but you were able to raise because the product was providing value and you used that to build revenue so that you didn't have to then rely as much on the investment cycle. Um, family and friends are your first co-founders, so make sure they're ready for the journey as well. In the early days, people will try to take large amounts of equity, so be wary, find good mentors, find good folks who can provide advice for free, not for free, whatever it may be, but find that balance where you can actually get that advice that you need. Consider whether you need employees or contractors. As you said in the early days, take a shower, <laughs> which I think is akin to slipping on a Helium VR set, if I would like to say so myself. Oh, yeah. um, get ironclad work product ownership agreements. Get IP consults so you can protect yourself very early on and look for accelerated programs to help you grow 
Local universities tend to have a lot of resources. Um, and also look for nationwide competitions to get your product out there. So I think that there's so many nuggets for people to follow up on, whether they are people looking to improve their own situations, people looking to start a company, so much in here um, that I can't wait to get out in the world. So thank you so much. The last little segment, I love to wrap up with what I call a moment of reflection. And I sort of asked this question earlier on. Um, so I would love for you to reach back to a different point in your career. The question I like to ask is, what is one thing you would like to tell your younger self about getting into the emerging tech industry and being successful? That knows are data. They are fertilizer that will help you grow. And you're going to experience a lot of no's um, and celebrate them because they will get you one step closer to a yes. Oh, I like that. That's a good reminder. It can be so easy to feel down after a no, but you're right. It's a it's an opportunity. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. This has been such a joy, such a breath of fresh air for me. You um, too. Yeah, right oh, back at you. You have a, a beautiful spirit, and I can I can feel that among your uh, uh, listeners as well. So, oh, well, thank you. That just warms me. Where can people find you? Follow you? Find Helium? I know it's in the App Store, so everyone should go download it, but any social media channels you want to plug, articles, whatever, give us give us yeah. all the info. We're on Twitter at Helium XR, um, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and go to tryhelium.com. And that's T-R-Y-H-E-A-L-I-U-M, like healing, tryhelium.com. So cool. And is it, do you have any personal social media accounts that you like to use? Yeah. For people uh, Sarah to with an H, Midmo, S-A-R-A-H-M-I-D-M-O on, on Twitter. I'm on uh, TikTok and Instagram and, and Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Yes. So, so everyone search. go follow Sarah, uh, share her work, <laughs> share her thoughts. So cool. For all the listeners out there, be sure to leave those five-star ratings and reviews. Check out other Holodeck Media podcasts, including Meta Business and Business of Esports. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn at, Wednesday, at Lindsay Poss. You can catch me Wednesday nights on the Business of Esports Live After Show. You can catch this podcast in your feed every week. See you next week. Thanks for joining us here on Meta Woman. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast everywhere you get your podcasts. Leave a five-star review and tell your friends, family, and colleagues all about us. Also, make sure to follow Meta TV on all socials to get more of the best metaverse content anywhere. Tune in every week for another episode of Meta Woman.